Hey, how y'all doing? Today we're going to talk about Fantasy Age, the basic rule book, and the bestiary, both from Green Ronin. This is essentially the engine that powered Dragon Age, pulled out of that setting, and um, stripped bare, and then presented in these books. I'll be very upfront with you. This is a fairly bare bones system. Now that's not a bad thing because what it does is it requires and sort of forces the GM to have a lot of ideas about his setting and the types of characters that inhabit his world. It is a, I think it is a high on GM prep at the beginning of the game. I think after that it can run pretty smoothly. I like to start with character creation in these things, so we're going to start there. Character creation begins by generating your abilities. Now, there are nine, which seems like an overwhelming number considering we're used to anywhere between five and six, but bear with me. They're not a bad nine to remember. Now, they are accuracy, which is sort of your hand-eye coordination, communication, your charisma, for lack of a better word, constitution, speaks for itself, dexterity, whole body stuff, whole body movement. Fighting, intelligence, perception, strength, and willpower. Okay, each one of these has a focus, or several foci, if you will, that you can choose from from underneath that umbrella. For example, under accuracy, there's like Eldritch Blast, Blast and then there's also bows. For communication, there's etiquette. Fighting has pole arms, and willpower has faith. We'll get to how those play in in just a second. Then you get to your races. Now, the standard races are presented here. Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Halfling, Human, and Orc is added in for your big bruiser types. Each one of these races gives you a bonus, a plus to one of your abilities. One or more skill foci, speed, which you know how fast you're going, languages you speak, and additional benefits on a table that you roll, get two of them, and then apply them to your character. Now, these are mostly weapon groups, uh, ability bonus, or bonus foci. All right, the classes themselves are really stripped down. There are three in point of fact, mage, rogue, and warrior. Now with each one of these, it tells you what the primary abilities are, what you really need to have there, the health of your, what your health, how healthy you are to start with, weapon groups, and finally what powers or abilities each one has. It then scales up from there. It will tell you level two rogue, here's what you get. Level 3 Warrior, here's what you get. The levels themselves range from 1 to 20, and each tier gives you a special widget. Now, to get your background of your character, there's also that included. First, you roll your social class. It's everything from upsider, outsider to upper class. There are six backgrounds under each one of those. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but they range everywhere from criminal to noble, just depending on which social strata you rolled into. The engine itself, the engine itself is 3D6. One of these D6 needs to be a different color for reasons I'll tell you in just a second. How this works is you roll 3D6, you pick the appropriate ability, whichever that number happens to be, ranging anywhere from negative two to four. And if you have a focus in that area that you can use, for example, if you're attacking with your pole arm, it would be 3d6 plus pole arm plus two for the focus. All right, that's straightforward enough. Now, like I said, one of those die has to be different. That's called your stunt die. You still add it in with everything else. It does not roll separately. It's not like a wild die or a fate die. It's rolled in and added in just the same, but that generates a number of stunt points. Now, there's another way to generate stunt points, and that is if you roll doubles in your dice pool. That also can give you bonus stunt points. There are stunt point reductions or additions for certain actions depending upon your class. Now, having the stunts included in the game, which is pretty much a requirement, does invert some of the normal flow of combat or normal flow of actions in a game. Because what you do is, before you state, I'm going to jump off the table, swing my pole arm down, and cut it in half. What you have to do is you make your roll first. And then you see, what happens with that roll is you see how well you do, and compared to the number of stunt points that you generate. They're now, using those stunt points, which do not carry over, you got to use them all in this round or not, they're not there anymore, 
that can tell you whether or not you make the jump, you get the additional move, you slice down, you make a roll out of it, stuff like that. So instead of declaring first what you're going to do, rolling the dice and then falling on your face, which happens to me more often than not, you, you now roll the dice and the dice inform you what your actions can be. So here's an example of some combat stunts. For one or more, it's skirmish. You can move yourself or the target of your attack two yards in any direction for one, for each stunt point that you spend. All the way up to five lethal blow, you inflict an extra 2d6 damage. That's pretty significant in this game, ladies and gentlemen. There are stunts for all kinds of purposes. The main place you will find them is in combat. There's also exploration stunts, role-playing stunts, and magic stunts. So there's, they're, they're all over the place for this. There are also talents your characters can pick up. These are sort of feats, for lack of a better word. And then after that, there is specializations, which is a focus for your class you get after you reach a certain level. There are things like arcane scholar, elementalist, sharpshooter, sword mage, etc. This is the core book. Like I said, it's pretty stripped down. Next one we're going to talk about fairly quickly is the bestiary. This is a functional bestiary. This has all kinds of critters that you can use, some of which you will recognize, some of which you're going to look at and scratch your head. There were several of those for me. For example, Charnel Knight. That one I can understand. It's pretty much just an undead death knight, that sort of thing. Chimera, you know what that is. Carnivorous plant, a Buddha. I think that's a knoll. Then you get some really weird ones in here, like Bakwani. Ah, I don't know. An Amet, which is sort of a cross between a crocodile and a lion. Amarok. So they've made up some names in here. They've had to strip propriety off of everything. Now, each one of the monsters gets a stat block. It's, you can roll for and its abilities and its foci. Speed, health, defense, that sort of thing, and then special qualities. And yes, the Basilisk doesn't turn you to stun now with its gaze, it just poisons you. Now, in addition to this, at the very back, there are ways to modify your monsters. There are ways to modify them to make them slightly better or worse, depending on your point of view and whether or not you're a player. The modifications in the back include making it more armored, burrowing, make it a clockwork monstrosity, sun blighted, all kinds of stuff that just makes your monsters unique and different. Fantasy Age and the Beast Theory. This gives you a fairly streamlined, straightforward fantasy role-playing game that does not have a lot of meat hanging on the skeleton. That's up to you as the GM to develop. So you can either, oh, blatantly steal, <coughs> excuse me, I mean lovingly emulate your favorite fantasy property this way, or you can make one up on your own. I would actually prefer the latter because that way your players have a significant amount of buy-in into the setting and they're more likely to be dedicated to it. Have fun gaming, y'all.